Hi, hello, dear listeners. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm Liv, your host. I usually say that more creatively. Anyway, I am your host, though. And I'm finally here with what I promised at the end of last year, the motherfucking Aeneid, the Odyssey of Rome, but a little less exciting because it doesn't star my main man. The story that the Romans cherished like no other, except maybe Hercules. They seriously loved Hercules, but we'll get there. Today's episode will begin the Aeneid, but it also comes from other sources, including Greek, a little prelude before we dive too deep into Rome, because Aeneas began in Greek mythology before he transitioned into the Roman savior, the founder of their civilization. This is episode 71. He's Greek and he's Roman. He's making Juno angry. He's Aeneas, baby! God, what a title. I can't even keep a straight face. Anyway, I love it. We begin with Aphrodite. Venus, as she will later be called when the Romans take hold, but for now, she's still Aphrodite. Because the first mention of Aeneas's origin is as far back as the 7th century BCE. We're talking Homer's time, in both Hesiod's Theogony and the Homeric Hymn to Aphrodite, both some of the earliest works we have from the ancient Greek world, and of course, he's in the Iliad. You see, the story of Aphrodite and of her son Aeneas is ancient as fuck. I did briefly tell you about Aeneas' birth in the Aphrodite episode, but since he's now the focus of our story, we'll do a little refresh to remind you of just how Aeneas got here. Aphrodite is the goddess of love and sex, and as such, she herself cannot resist the passion of love and sex, no matter how she may wish to at times. There was a time that Zeus sought to figure out how Aphrodite was getting the other gods into so much trouble with the mortals. You see, according to her hymn, it is Aphrodite who, mostly for her own entertainment, had Zeus have sex with so, so many mortal women and give them half-mortal children. And it was Aphrodite who had other gods and goddesses, too, have sex with mortals, something that is rarely a proud moment for the gods, though one could argue Zeus gets pretty okay with it at some point. Regardless, at this time, Zeus is trying to figure it out, but she simply will not tell him how she does it. And this, as one might imagine, frustrates our guy Zeus. So, He thinks to himself, if Aphrodite won't tell me how it's done, I will use my godly powers to make her fall in love with a mortal man, and once she's in love with him, she won't be able to resist having sex with him, and so will put herself in the same place as the rest of us, having sex with mortals and bearing them children. And Kizzy's is the mortal man Zeus selects for this. So, quite suddenly, Aphrodite is truly, madly, deeply in love with a random man named Ankizes. Ankizes, meanwhile, is minding his own damn business, tending to his cattle up in Mount Ida, near Troy. Aphrodite, looking to really impress Ankizes, first goes to her temple on Cyprus, where she has her priestesses rubber down all nice with fragrant oils, so that she not only looks super sexy, but she smells like it too. And now, the more I continue on with this story, the more I remember telling it in pretty good detail during my series on the Trojan War. Episode 32, I've just determined, because I looked it up. So I'll get to the point. Aphrodite ultimately does indeed have sex with Anchises, but she's immediately disturbed by herself. A mortal? Who even am I? She thinks. Ugh. But there's nothing to be done. It's happened, and now she's pregnant with this mortal's son. Seriously, why? She thinks. And so, Aeneas, son of Anchises and Aphrodite, and a prince of Troy, is born. And if you want more details on it, go back and listen to episode 32. I bet there's a lot about Aeneas in there. Cut to the Trojan War is over. And if you want more, go listen to those past episodes. Do me a solid. And for the Greeks, 
concern with the man named Aeneas, the son of Aphrodite and Anchises, ends. He fought on the side of the Trojans, and the Trojans lost, something the Greeks will remember always. Beyond this, for the Greeks, he isn't important. Enter the Romans. As I mentioned in the earlier episode on Rome and Virgil, the Romans, like the Greeks, wanted to align themselves with heroic ancestry. The Greeks could talk forever about Achilles and Agamemnon, Odysseus and Menelaus. These were men they considered historical, who fought the most epic of epic wars, and won, and oh what trials they encountered during and after the war. The Romans wanted this too. They wanted impressive, historic men to consider their ancestors to look back on with this level of pride that rivals anything else. And nothing was more historic or important than the Trojan War. So it seems only appropriate that a prince of Troy, the surviving prince of Troy, eventually makes his way to Rome, where he becomes the ancestor to Rome itself. This is the Aeneid, the story of Rome. Aeneas transforms from this minor hero in Homer's Iliad who fights well in the war but isn't a main concern of anyone's, save for Aphrodite for a time, into the last hope of the Trojans in the guiding light of Rome. We begin with our narrator laying things out. He sings of the man exiled from Troy, bound to reach the shores of Latium, what will become Rome, on the coast of Italy. He sings of the rage of a goddess who battered the man with storms at sea and from the sky. What goddess is that? I bet you can guess. Who is our angry goddess? Juno. Hera, wife of Jupiter, Zeus. But why is Juno so very angry with this man who set out from Troy to Latium? Well, let me tell you. There is a city, an ancient city across from Italy, on the continent that we now call Africa, in ancient Libya. The city is Carthage, famous for their skill in warfare, a true rival to Rome in the quest to rule the Mediterranean. The tip of Libya, where Carthage is located, is closer than you'd think to Italy. Sicily specifically, there's an ocean away, but a section of the ocean is very, very narrow. It's said that Juno loves Carthage most of all, more than any other city. And here's the thing about Carthage that you should know. It's completely real and supremely important in ancient history. And how much do we talk about it? Not nearly as much as Greece and Rome, that's for sure. And when you do hear about Carthage, it's typically just because they were frequently warring with Greece and Rome, but nothing more. Hmm, I wonder why couldn't be the continent it it was on, and therefore the color of the skin of its people. No, that would be crazy. Not recognizing the authority and importance of an ancient and innovative civilization because they weren't white? Madness. Anyway, Carthage was fucking badass. They were originally founded by Phoenicians of Tyre, but eventually became their own separate city-state. Mythologically and possibly historically, they were founded by a queen named Dido. Yes, a fucking queen was their founder. So that's Carthage, and I'll be talking about them more. Don't you worry. For now, it's Carthage that Juno loves, that she wants to see rule the Mediterranean world. It's said that it's there she keeps her chariot and her armor, even. But Juno is worried because she's heard that there will come a time that people of Trojan blood come to Carthage and defeat the Carthaginians who, during this time, are still a citadel of Tyre, of the Phoenicians. People skilled in warfare and of Troy are destined to defeat Libya. This is what has been foretold and what is so concerning to the goddess Juno, queen of the gods, wife of Jupiter, she who definitely handles her anger appropriately. Juno's fear and anger at this possibility is made worse due to her history with Troy, all the work she put in to help the Greeks defeat the Trojans, and now, even after their wretched defeat, they threaten her city of Carthage? (sighs) No. Juno will not permit this to occur. She will exhaust all her energy preventing the remaining Trojans from crossing the sea and reaching Carthage. Quote, So formidable, the task of founding Rome. (laughs) 
Thus, the tone is set, but we don't begin at the beginning of Aeneas' story. Virgil is trying to mimic Homer, and that isn't Homer's way. We must begin in the middle of things, in medias res. So the ship nears Carthage. Sicily is still in sight behind them, so it won't be long now, before the ships reach the shores of Juno's beloved city. Her anger grows with every passing second. Will I be prevented from saving the city? Are the fates so against me? Pallas, Athena, was able to destroy the ships of Ajax for his discretions in the war. Cannot I now? Athena is referred to here as Pallas, which is another name for her that's both Greek and Roman, but her Roman name that will likely come up later is Minerva, like McGonagall. Juno cannot accept that she cannot succeed in something that Pallas found so easy to do, No, that cannot stand. So Juno seeks the help of one of the gods who can best handle these types of predicaments. You remember him from the Odyssey. And bonus, he has the same name in Latin. Yes, Juno seeks out the god Aeolus, god of the winds, to help her in stopping the Trojan ship from reaching the shores of Carthage. Juno reaches the home of Aeolus, king in his cavern, where he uses his powers to keep the winds of the world locked away. The mountain moans with the sound of the trapped winds. It was Juno's husband, Jupiter, who gave Aeolus the power to keep the winds under control, who imprisoned them within the mountains for fear that, were they set free, the entire world would be carried away. Aeolus, calls Juno, who Jove gave the powers of the wind, I need your help. There is a ship of defeated men of Troy seeking to bring the gods of Troy to Latium. You must help me stop them. Send winds at their ship, shake it back and forth in the angry sea. You must sink the ships, throw their bodies off the sides, let them float broken on the water. But Juno doesn't come to Aeolus empty-handed. She isn't so naive to think he'd do this simply because she's asked it of him. There are fourteen nymphs devoted to me, she tells Aeolus. Diopea is the most beautiful, and I will give her to you as your reward, to make your wife and the mother of your children. Ah, my favorite thing, women as property. This is enough for Aeolus. He knows this is quite the gift, and he owes every power he has to Juno's own husband, Jupiter. I will do as you order, he tells her, for you and for Jupiter, the reason I have a place amongst the gods. And with that, Aeolus takes a spear and jabs a hole in his mountain, the mountains that contain the winds. In an instant, a burst of winds rushes forth from the mountain, all the winds in one, Notus, Eurus, and Africus, and southwest, east, and south. Just as Juno hoped and planned, the winds hit Aeneas' ship immediately. The ship is nearly capsized, men fall overboard, and Aeneas cries up at the sky, calling out in anguish. So many Trojans were already lost in the war, but if they were to die now, how much preferable it would have been to die amongst the other Trojan heroes still at Troy than here on the sea so far from it. Next, a tsunami, a wall of water, comes down on Aeneas' ship, making the situation far worse. It forces the ship into nearby rocks that smash against its sides. Aeneas watches as the other ships in his fleet meet with the winds and the waters. Three are pushed ashore, deep into the sand. Others are dashed upon the rocks, losing countless men aboard. Aeneas watches as Trojan treasure sinks into the sea, the last of his country. Finally, the commotion is noticed by Neptune, Poseidon, the god of the sea. He sees the winds forcing the ship aground or onto the rocks, the men screaming, Aeneas calling out for help. He knows who's done this. It's so obviously the work of his sister, Juno, and her anger. Neptune is furious with his sister. You'll recall he was on the side of the Trojans during the war. The gods have not let go of their rivalries in that respect. Neptune angrily calls together the winds that have been causing all this upset. What do you think you're doing? Do you believe you have the power to upset the seas in this way? That the god of the sea is not the one to determine this? 
Neptune must first calm the waves, but he assures the winds that they will face an appropriate punishment once he's done. For now, he tells them, leave and tell your king that it is up to the god of the sea to rule the seas. That power was not given to Aeolus. In a split second, upon Neptune's words, the waters calm, the winds subside, the clouds disappear from the sky, and the sun begins to shine brightly on the calm waters. Neptune gives the job of helping the stranded ships to his son, Triton, and the Nereid, Kimothui. Together they push the ships from the rocks and back into the sea, steadying them as they go. So, finally, with the help of Neptune, many of the ships have been saved, and Aeneas and his remaining men, in their utter exhaustion, seek the nearest land to where they are. Libya. Carthage. Aeneas and the seven remaining men make their way into a long, deep port with a breakwater that serves as shelter. There's a cave with seats carved of stone and fresh water provided by the nymphs, the perfect place to rest after what the Trojans have just been through. And they do, taking stock of what's left after the storm. Some of the men move to the beach where they build a fire, trying to salvage their waterlogged food. Aeneas, though, climbs up a cliff to see if he can make out any survivors from the storm that they might have missed, any ships that might have been saved. There's nothing, though, no remnants visible in the sea at all. But he does see a herd of stags nearby, and he and his men are so hungry, so he brings his bow and arrow, and with a few shots he's found enough food for the remaining men. He kills seven stags in the end, one for each ship, and brings them back to the camp. With this small success, this small consolation after the day they've had, Aeneas speaks to his assembled men. We've been through worse than this before, he tells them. He reminds them that they'd faced Scylla and the Cyclops too, because it seems they had a very similar experience to Odysseus when leaving Troy. The gods will end this, too. Through all our perils, remember that we are journeying to Latium, where fortune assures us we will find a peaceful home and successful lives, where we will have a second coming of Troy. It's all been foreseen, he reminds them. So stay strong and brave. Know that we're on our way to a much happier life. He tells them all this in the most hopeful way he can muster, though at this point, Aeneas himself is feeling entirely hopeless. Thank you all for listening to this as we start the most famous story from ancient Rome, the most famous piece of insane political propaganda that's also incredibly dramatic and enjoyable to read, but we'll get there. Next week, we'll be back with more of the Aeneid, and we are fast approaching the Vancouver Fan Expo, so I remind you, if you are anywhere near Vancouver, Canada, please, please come out to the Fan Expo and show your support. Make me feel like there's actually people there that want to see me. I'm selling merch. I'm going to be going on panels and having a live show that I probably won't record because it sounds really technical and I don't know how to do it. So it'll be just for the people there. Exclusive. Very exciting. And also just uh, showing how my lack of actual technological knowledge, even after all this time, such is life. Anyway, thank you all. You're the best. Please, you know, rate, review, subscribe, all the regular things. Tell your friends. Let's spread the word. Oh, I'm getting a little crazy today. It's been a long one. Anyway, I'm Liv, and I do love this shit. <laughs>